Thank you very much. Uh, this is the talk on the detailed discussion of depth of anaesthesia monitoring. Uh, and I hope you now see the sort of structure as we've laid out the day that the original lecture I gave this morning uh, illustrated the overview to identify the signals from the noise. And each of the subsequent talks has sort of explained in more depth what the signals are and on occasions discounted those as signals. Um, depth of anaesthesia monitoring I sort of whetted your appetites uh, with the comment uh, this morning. It's a hot topic. Uh, it's uh, an important um, philosophical question almost. How do we know uh, if a paralyzed patient is also conscious or not? And uh, a solution is that if we could directly access the brain and its function, uh, we, we would know the answer to that question. Uh, but it's an open question as regards depth of anesthesia monitoring. And here we're talking about the processed EEG monitoring, like the BIS, et cetera. Um, the Be Aware trial um, showed a dramatic five-fold reduction in awareness with BIS, uh, highly significant and caused a, a big stir. But that uh, has not been uh, substantiated in other trials, equally well-powered uh, and so on. So the Be Unaware trial found no change in BIS, and more recently the Bag Recall trial, if anything, found a higher incidence in the BIS group by considerable margin, but this was non-significant. So it is very much, in the trial world, an open question. Um, when we, after we started our NAP5 project, uh, we felt rather unhelpfully NICE came out with its uh, infamous diagnostic guidance in 2013. And quite apart from the details uh, of what it said, our main concern was that it might disrupt um, the, the collection of our data because it would influence practice greatly in, in a particular direction. Um, what NICE recommended in brief was that depth of anesthesia monitors should be considered an option, uh, whatever that means, as if they were not already, in high-risk groups uh, with the uncertainty as to what high-risk meant. And there was no guidance at all offered on uh, their usage uh, or interpretation or how to use them in any sort of algorithmic sense. Um, NICE suggested that uh, one should aim for a value of under 60, uh, which on the face of it seemed reasonable. But what was left unexplained uh, was whether uh, it was worse to have a, a high BIS, of say 85 for a very brief period of time, 10 seconds, or a marginally high BIS, of say 62, for 30 minutes. Are they equivalent, uh, or is one worse than the other, and if so, which one and why? This and other issues were discussed in an editorial that Tim and I wrote almost to, um, well, I suppose, yes, I just want to admit it now, to neutralize any possible effect uh, that the NICE <laughs> guidelines may have on the practice of anaesthetists and to retain, maintain this as an open question and not a closed question, because the danger of NICE was that it became a closed question. And so this is the graph I referred to earlier uh, in questioning. We did uh, post hoc analyze the, the reporting rate uh, after we started the uh, NAP5 study. And uh, you know things shot up. Sort of the monthly uh, returns from local coordinators, you know, shot up nicely, hovered around. And and this was the nice. And we thought they'd sort of scream upwards or, or whatever. And they didn't. They sort of hovered up and down uh, with the guidance and the editorial. So we were satisfied that despite nice guidance, um, it didn't affect our reporting. And indeed, it didn't seem to affect the behaviour uh, of anaesthetists because if you recall in the baseline survey. Uh, this was almost uh, identical to the uh, estimated, guesstimated use, uh, low use of depth of anaesthesia uh, monitoring. Uh, so the activity survey uh, found a rate of 2.8%. So it's still used very low. It seems that the anaesthetists have not followed, for whatever reason, the NICE guidance. Um, the headline, the, the thing I tempted you with to stay for this conference in part, uh, was uh, that we found a higher incidence of the use of monitoring uh, in the uh, AAGA cohort, the certain probable cases, which on the face of it would superficially uh, regard, uh, cause us to regard monitoring as a risk factor. Uh, but it can't surely be a risk. This has to be explained. It doesn't make logical sense. So what is the explanation of the paradox? And that's the purpose, to look at the data more closely. So what we did, we looked at the hazard ratio of the uh, anaesthetic techniques, and, and very crudely, broadly, we uh, categorized them into four modes. Uh, you can have volatile uh, or, or TIVA, and the volatile can be with neuromuscular blockade or without, and so can the TIVA. 
And then uh, we did the hazard, hazard ratio. We know uh, the proportions of their use in the activity survey, and we know the proportions of their use in the awareness cohort. And so this ratio uh, represents the risk. If it's low, then it's not a risk. If it's one, then it's neutral. If it's lower than that, that technique is, inverted commas, protective. And the higher it is, the more risky that technique is as practiced in our uh, study. So volatile with, with no blockade uh, is clearly uh, not only not a risk, but arguably protective uh, of awareness. Uh, you introduce neuromuscular blockade, and suddenly uh, that becomes a risk, doubles the overall risk of awareness. TIVA of itself uh, is not a, a risk uh, without blockade, and arguably, again, somewhat protective. But TIVA with blockade is very much a risk, almost fourfold a risk for awareness. So that's a sort of crude overview of the, the risk profile of the various techniques that we might um, adopt. And of course, it's not comprehensive because with reference to Alistair Nimmo's talk, it doesn't include all the sort of mixed techniques, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just to, to gauge where we are. So parallel to that, we then look at the ratio of use of the depth of anesthesia monitors uh, in the activity survey versus uh, the cases. Uh, so again, a similar sort of uh, categorization here. We have the proportions from the activity survey and the proportions from our cohort. Uh, and this time, uh, uh, the, the ratio uh, is, is, is uh, similar, but slightly different. Uh, the lower this number, uh, then it means that the monitor is conferring some protection. Okay, it's mitigating any previous risk. And the higher the, no uh, the, higher the number, uh, the monitor is not uh, really achieving anything. So uh, volatile agent, uh, no neuromuscular blockade, was only used in 1% uh, of cases in the activity survey. So people really don't use a depth of anesthesia monitor where there's no neuromuscular blockade. And we didn't find any uh, such cases uh, in the awareness cohort where the monitor had been used. So we can't really calculate a meaningful ratio. Introduce the neuromuscular blocking drugs, and, and people use it a little bit more um, but then we start to see some cases. The overall hazard ratio is, is, is near unity. So the monitor is neither doing any good nor any harm, crudely interpreted. TIVA without muscle relaxant, uh, we see that uh, it's about 8% use. But um, interestingly, we see uh, a much greater um, use uh, of, of the monitor. So, so the monitor is now used in 8% in, in uh, of, of these cases. Uh, and there was one case which gives a sort of high hazard ratio to be interpreted with caution because that's only one case. Uh, so, you know, yes, it's, it's, it's there, but it's, it's query. Uh, but then introduce the um, neuromuscular blocker, and we find an interesting thing, that almost 25% of anaesthetists uh, are using a monitor in these cases. So there's selective use. Uh, and furthermore, calculating the hazard ra ratio, it's very low. So this seems to be the subgroup. Uh, in which the monitor may be conferring the greatest benefit. So the conclusions of this analysis of the previous table and this table is first, anaesthetists out there, all of you, us, are selectively, naturally, without any specific advice from anyone, we're selectively using monitoring uh, for certain modes of anaesthesia, namely TIVA with neuromuscular blockade. Um, and secondly, um, that... Uh, that is the subgroup, that combination, in which there appears to be the greatest apparent benefit of the use of these monitors. So naturally, a large number of anaesthetists seem to be doing the right thing, we think. There was an extra possible benefit of depth of anaesthesia monitoring that we detected on analysis of the cases. Of the six awareness cases where a monitor was, was used, only one was distressed. Um, uh, despite the use of neuromuscular blockade. So whether there is an impact uh, that the outcomes are milder in some manner with depth of anesthesia monitoring use, uh, again, is a, is a question worth, worth asking. And we can speculate it could be because there's prompter reaction, uh, prompter deepening, uh, or, or, or whatever. Um, uh, so an important conclusion guiding future research, there, there are really two. One is that trials, which hitherto, as Alistair also pointed out, they haven't specified really uh, uh, whether um, you know, neuromuscular blockade was used or not. If, if, if you want to see an impact of monitoring, 
the trial to construct is really to, to be specific and restrict it to this group where intravenous anesthesia is used with neuromuscular blockade. And then that might wipe out all the uncertainties of the previously published trials, and it may show quite a, a useful benefit. Uh, we don't know, but that's what we've suggested. So people should rush out there and start registering that trial. And secondly, as none of the previous trials have done, they hadn't looked at the overall impact on the patients in these trials that were, that, that were aware. Um, and again, uh, it would be interesting if in the monitored group, uh, those patients showed lesser impact. So that's a positive spin on what was originally a, a bad signal. Uh, there is further caution, though, um, as to how to use these depth of anesthesia monitors, and we hope that these sorts of things uh, will eventually inform any guidance that comes out, any sort of algorithms. One is um, this uh, practice of titrating the agent to the depth of anesthesia output, even down to extremely low agent levels. Here's a vignette. An elderly patient undergoing cardiac surgery. This is touched upon by John Mackay as well. The BIS was uh, maintained at below 60. The anesthetists were clearly titrating it to that level. But the end tidal anesthetic concentration in achieving that was allowed to drift down to as low as 0.4 mac, so about 0.3 percent isoflurane. And unsurprisingly, the patient had awareness with distress during positioning. An elderly patient, abdominal surgery, again, the bis was kept titrated. This was a titrating exercise to below 55. But again, the end tidal concentration was allowed to drop to 0.4 mac. And this patient suffered, suffered awareness with pain, but happily no distress. So these were unusually low doses of anesthetic that ended up being administered, even though the bis was within the sort of officially published limits. There's another caution, um, and it's this. Uh, that if a, a monitor is used and its output spikes, if it's high, and you should properly record it as such, then this becomes compelling evidence that awareness occurred, even if the patient's story is vague. OK, and we had uh, this sort of thing. Patient made a complaint of awareness after an orthopedic surgery, along with several other complaints on happiness with care. The account of the awareness was rather vague and of itself would probably not have merited concern. However, the BIS was used and it was faithfully recorded at 65 after the incision, but it was 45 afterwards. And it was this data that made us, and we think everyone uh, else would agree, that this uh, awareness was probably genuine and part of the complaint. So there is a caution, there's a risk benefit to using anything. Uh, and depth of anesthesia monitors are not immune from that risk-benefit ratio. There's another caution, or at least an understanding, that needs to be uh, acquired, as we acquired it slowly, that the majority of awareness cases arise at induction or soon after uh, the start of surgery. Um, and the question is, are monitors used at that point? So this is the time point at which the risks occur, but we were not certain, and we think the answer is no, that in the cases reported uh, that monitors are actually used in that time period. Perhaps by the aficionados, uh, they are. But we think, from the majority, from the evidence we've seen, they're not. Uh, and if they are, then questions arise. Should the same thresholds apply, 60, or should different thresholds apply? And if so, why? Note also that this is also the time when MAC alarms, minimum MAC alarms, as the Americans have suggested, are essential, may not be as useful because it's a dynamic situation where the induction may be predominantly intravenous, uh, intravenous bolus. So the recommendations, uh, we've touched upon some of these already in the talks. We, we need to be familiar with the existing monitors uh, in, in a deep sense. We, need, we do need to use them more in order to acquire that familiarity, including the science as well as the practice. We have also recommended that the isolated forearm technique be taught and more widely practiced as an alternative way of monitoring. It is incredibly useful uh, and should be adopted much more widely than it is. Uh, there is a need for pragmatic protocols for how to use the monitors and respond to their outputs that also integrates with other information like heart rate, blood pressure, and so on. And those uh, useful protocols are lacking. It's, at the moment, it's almost like an art form which is, uh, cannot be articulated by anyone, and that needs to change. We have suggested that the monitors are most likely useful 
when neuromuscular blockade is used, and particularly so uh, in context of TIVA. So that is a time when to consider using them at their most. And logically, if you are going to use them, uh, then logically they should be used from the very start of, at or before induction. I think that's it. Thank you.